Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Fujifilm and Sonosite on ultrasound guided paravertebral nerve blocks. My name is Dr. Teresa Bowling and I am the Director of Regional Anesthesia at the Stanford Hospital located in Stanford, Connecticut. I am also the President and Course Director of the Stanford School of Regional Anesthesia where we teach ultrasound guided nerve blocks during Saturday seminars in Stanford, Connecticut. You can contact us at SSRAUSA.com or visit my online version of the Saturday Seminar at SSRAOnlineCME.com. This presentation provides a general overview of the basic ultrasound examinations, evaluations, and procedures performed in the point-of-care environment. This presentation does not constitute a complete course of training. You should not perform these bedside ultrasound evaluations and procedures solely in reliance upon the information in this presentation. The webinar objectives include how to learn the different techniques to perform an ultrasound guided thoracic paravertebral block, to learn the gross anatomy and sonoanatomy of the paravertebral space, and to understand the indications and contraindications of thoracic paravertebral blocks. A thoracic paravertebral block is anesthesia or analgesia that is conceptually similar to a unilateral epidural anesthesia if placed on one side. Higher or lower levels can be chosen to accomplish a unilateral or bilateral band-like segmental blockade. It's important to have a conversation with your surgeon prior to the procedure to ask him or her where the incision will be so that you will know where the pain will be generated from so that you can pay, place your block at the optimal level to provide the best analgesia for your patient. That's why it's critical to know your anatomical landmarks. A thoracic paravertebral block is usually performed in thoracic region as an analgesic for breast surgery, thoracic surgery, or rib fractures, and that is what we use this block for in my practice. It can be utilized in certain situations when epidural analgesia is contraindicated. For example, mild coagulopathy, hypotension, or sepsis. The benefits include maintaining hemodynamic stability, preserving bladder sensation, and promoting early mobilization. The approaches include a landmark-based approach and an ultrasound-guided approach the parasagittal approach, and the transverse intercostal approach. It's important to understand your landmark-based anatomy. When lur lurking at the cervical spine, the C7 spinous process is usually the most prominent spinous process. The level of the nipple corresponds with the T4 dermatome and the base of the scapula with the T7 dermatome. It's important to remember that the transverse process that is directly lateral from a particular spinous process actually originates from the vertebral body one level below. So remember this when you're placing your block and deciding where to put your needle. This is the paravertebral space gross anatomy in a cross-section picture. The red triangle located in the picture is the paravertebral space labeled PVS. The bottom of the picture is the posterior aspect of the patient, or the back, and the top of the picture is the anterior aspect. The borders of the paravertebral space are defined by the posterior border, which is made up of the transverse process, labeled TP, the internal intercostal ligament, which is attached to the transverse process. The anterior aspect is the parietal pleura, and that is adjacent to the lung, which is pink in this picture on the anterior aspect. The medial aspect is composed of the spinous process body, SP, the disc, and the intervertebral foramen. This is the same picture. Again, the right red triangle defines the paravertebral space. If you were going to use a landmark-based approach, you would identify the spinous process at the level that you want to block. You would then use a ruler to mark off a two and a half centimeter mark lateral to the spinous process. You would then inject a needle there and you would hit the edge of the spinous process. You would remove the needle one centimeter and redirect it caudally and then re-advance. 
At that point, you should penetrate the internal intercostal membrane and enter the paravertebral space. This is the ultrasound image of the paravertebral space looking at the same boundaries. The posterior boundary is the transverse process labeled T2 in this image. You can see the hyperechoic bony structure and below it the bony dropout where T2 is the label. The internal intercostal ligament is the other border of the posterior aspect labeled IIM in this picture. It's a thin hyperechoic line. The anterior aspect is the parietal pleural, labeled PM, and that is the brightest hyperechoic structure below which is the lung, which in a live image would be moving. And the medial aspect, again, is the spinous process body, to the left of this image by the medial aspect of the photograph, disc and intervertebral foramen. The small arrows in this image show a needle entering the paravertebral space. The blue triangle, again, defines the paravertebral space, below the internal intercostal membrane, above the parietal membrane, and adjacent to the transverse process. The ultrasound approaches are parasagittal or transverse intercostal. Positioning for a paravertebral block can be sitting or prone. The sitting position, you place the patient neck flex and hands on their lap on the edge of the stretcher or the bed. You rest their forehead on the edge of an adjustable height table, we use a mayo stand, and topped with a pillow for patient comfort. Keep the patient's head in a neutral rotation and a flex position, looking straight at the floor, to assist with ideal imaging and anatomic relationships. Avoid placing the patient's arms on the tray during positioning in order to prevent the scapula obscuring the field of view and acting as an obstacle to needle entry. This is a picture of a patient having a paravertebral block in the sitting position. The patient's head is at the top of the photograph leaning over a mayo stand, and the bottom of the photograph is the patient's lower body. The ultrasound probe is in a parasagittal approach and the needle is being injected in a caudal to cephalad injection at about a 45 degree angle. We now do this block primarily in the prone position for two reasons. The patient in a prone position is more stable and unable to move, unlike the sitting position where they can move forward or from left to right, and this allows you to sedate the patient more heavily for patient comfort. We place a pillow under the patient's lower chest, whether they're on a stretcher or the operating room table, and their arms are hanging from the sides of the stretcher. This photograph shows a patient in the prone position in the operating room with their head at the top of the photograph looking toward the floor. You can see their left arm with the blood pressure cuff hanging over the edge of the operating room table also to the floor. This patient has been prepped and draped for a paravertebral catheter. And if you look closely, you can see the purple demarcation of where we've marked off two and a half centimeters lateral from the spinous process to optimize where the initial probe position would start. The ultrasound guided paravertebral block in the parasagittal approach is done with a linear ultrasound probe placed in a sagittal plane parallel to the direction of the neural axis on top of the spinous process. The probe is then tilted and slided in the desired direction laterally. You then move the probe cephalad and caudad so that the transverse process below the target is slightly off the screen. This is one block where you don't want your target ideally centered on the screen because the angle is very acute between the transverse processes. So if you don't have your target slightly off the screen, it's very challenging to get the needle between the two transverse processes. And we'll see that in ultrasound video shortly. The needle is advanced in plane. Another clinical pearl is this block, it's very often difficult to keep the needle in plane continuously. And that's because the needle trajectory is actually away from the ultrasound beam at an acute angle, and very often this can be a deeper block. So it's very helpful to have an assistant hydrodissect with normal saline as you're advancing the needle so that you can visualize the tip as you're doing this block. The goal is to displace the pleura to a deeper position on the ultrasound image on your screen. And again, we'll see this shortly. 
This is an ultrasound image of the parasagittal approach. The needle trajectory is again towards the midline, towards the transverse process. The borders are defined by the parietal membrane, PM, the IIM, which is the internal intercostal membrane. And you want your needle tip below the internal inter intercostal membrane because this block is very similar to an epidural that you will have continuous spread because the paravertebral space is continuous. We do a single injection at one level, and this achieves multiple levels of analgesia over several dermatomes because the paravertebral space is continuous, again, like an epidural. If you inject above the internal intercostal membrane, you will achieve a single level intercostal block, which will be suboptimal. This slide demonstrates a pre-injection and a post-injection ultrasound image. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see the landmarks we've discussed. The TPs are the round transverse price processes that are hyperechoic with the bony dropout below. The lowermost hyperechoic line is the pleura, below which is the lung. And above that is the paravertebral space. In the right-hand side, you can see a post-injection image with expansion of the paravertebral space due to injection of local anesthetic. And even though these images are the exact same depth, you can see the pleura has dipped down as the local anesthetic has pushed it toward the lung. If your final injection looks like the image on the right-hand side, you can be confident that you will have an excellent block postoperatively. The purpose of this ultrasound video is to show you the difference when you scan in a parasagittal approach going from medial to lateral. The ideal image for this block is to have round transverse processes like we've seen in the still images, a well-defined pleura, and internal intercostal membrane. If your ultrasound probe is too far lateral, you will approach the ribs, not the transverse processes, which become flattened. This is flat ribs, and then we move medially, and there is the image you want. You can see the internal intercostal membrane, the pleura, and the round transverse processes. As you scan laterally, you lose that image and you see ribs. Medially, pleura, IIM, and transverse processes. Lateral, flattened ribs, this is not where you want to inject. You will not have an effective block. The transverse process is labeled here TP, again the same image, and the internal intercostal membrane below which is the hypoechoic paravertebral space below which is the pleura and then the lung. Your target is below the internal intercostal membrane. The needle will be approaching from the right hand side of your screen and again it will come in and out of plane as we discussed. You advance the needle carefully and slowly and you can see the needle tip right there is right above the internal intercostal membrane. We slowly advance, and when we believe we're below the internal intercostal membrane, we inject. If we are in the correct place, you will see the expansion of the paravertebral space and the dipping of the pleura. Our assistant is about to inject the local anesthetic, and as we do, you will see the space expand and the pleura dip down into the image. And clearly, at the end of this video, you will see that the paravertebral space is markedly wider than the initial injection. And there is the image you want to see. Clearly, a more wide paravertebral space and a dipping of the pleura. This is another ultrasound image of the parasagittal approach. Again, the transverse processes, the round bony structures connected by the internal intercostal membrane, below which is the paravertebral space, and then the lowermost bright hyperechoic line, the pleura. The needle will be approaching from the right-hand side of this image, again coming in and out of plane. We slowly advance. You can see the needle there clearly, but then it disappears. Advancing. And then the anesthesiologist does believe she is below the internal intercostal membrane, so she asks her assistant to inject some normal saline. And it does appear the needle is in the right place. However, watch what happens when the injection is done. 
It's clearly above the internal intercostal membrane and there was air in the syringe which obscured the image. So another clinical pearl is to make sure you get all of the air out of your syringe. You then redirect the needle and advance it slowly. You do not want to perforate the pleura. And when you do believe you're below the internal intercostal membrane, you again inject one, one ml of local anesthetic to look for expansion of the paravertebral space. The needle is advanced, the injection is done, and you can see the pleura dipping down into the lung. The other approach is the transverse intercostal approach. Again, a linear probe is placed in the axial transverse plane on the rib at the selected thoracic level, just lateral to the spinous process. You move the transducer caudad into the intercostal space between adjacent ribs. The needle is advanced in plane in a lateral to medial trajectory, and you can see that in the photograph on the right-hand side. This is a patient I took care of who is in the operating room with her head face towards the floor, the probe in a axial transverse plane, and the needle being inserted in a, a lateral to medial trajectory. Remember, the paravertebral space is a wedge-shaped hypoechoic layer demarcated by the hyperechoic lines of the pleura below and the internal intercostal membrane above. Here is the ultrasound image of the paravertebral space in the transverse intercostal approach. The left-hand side of this image is the lateral aspect of the patient, and the right-hand side is the medial aspect, below which is the transverse process with the bony dropout. To the left is the bright hyperechoic pleura, below which is the lung. The arrows in this photograph are pointing to the needle, which is located in the paravertebral space below the internal intercostal membrane. This is the same ultrasound image with all the definitions applied. Again, the medial aspect on the right-hand side of this image is the transverse process. To the left and lateral aspect is the bright pleura, above which you see local anesthetic spread in the paravertebral space. The dotted line defines the internal intercostal membrane, above which is the external intercostal muscle. This approach, unlike the parasagittal approach, is easier to keep the needle in plane because the angle is less acute for the needle and the paravertebral space appears wider on your image. This is the same approach, although the photograph is reversed, the medial side of the patient is now on the left and the lateral side is on the right. The same anatomy, transverse process on the left, medial aspect posts um, a bony structure with bony dropout. The paravertebral space is a triangular shaped space defined by the internal intercostal membrane and the pleura. This is a video of this approach. In the still image, you can see on the left-hand side the transverse process, to the right the bright hyperechoic pleura, above which is the paravertebral space, and the thin hyperechoic intercost um, IIM. The needle will approach from the right-hand side of this image, again coming in and out of plane, with an assistant ready to inject to see the needle tip if necessary, the needle is advanced, looking for that spread of the paravertebral space with local anesthetic and the dip of the pleura. That's above the internal intercostal membrane. You can see the needle is now re-advanced, and you can see the pleura dipping down and local anesthetic filling the paravertebral space, which is now markedly wider than the pre-injection image. Now, as you can see, you can't see the needle in this image, but you know your block is in the right place because of the expansion of the local anesthetic and the paravertebral space. The indications for thoracic paravertebral block include breast surgery, chest surgery, and rib fractures. We're going to start by talking about breast surgery. These are two articles published in 2010-2011 looking at the efficacy and safety of paravertebral blocks in breast surgery and comparing general anesthesia to thoracic paravertebral blocks for breast surgery. And this is what they found. Improved pain scores compared to general anesthesia. Decreased nausea due to decreased narcotics. A low incidence of adverse events. The risk of pneumothorax is less than 1%, and that's what I've seen in my practice, even in the hands of beginners. 
and increased patient satisfaction and a shorter hospital stay with regional anesthesia over general anesthesia. And clearly, in this decade, patient satisfaction and hospital stay are driving reimbursement. So these are critical differences. And there's no question that ultrasound contributes to improve safety, safety and efficacy of placing this block compared to doing it with landmarks. This is a study I'm extremely proud of because we did it at the Stanford Hospital and the lead investigator was one of my partners, Vlad Frank. We pr uh, presented this at ASRA in Las Vegas in 2015. And what we knew was postoperative pain control is the major determinant in hospital length of stay and narcotic use in patients undergoing mastectomy. Using a multimodality approach to perioperative analgesia with peri paravertebral nerve blocks and then including pre- and postoperative oral gabapentin in patients who were candidates, we significantly reduced both length of stay and narcotic use compared to conventional postoperative management with on-demand postoperative narcotic pain medications. We did a retrospective chart review looking at 129 patients who had mastectomies between 2009 and 2014. Patients were grouped by analgesic type, conventional analgesia, paravertebral catheters, and paravertebral catheters with gabapentin. These patients underwent bilateral mastectomies and mastectomies with tissue expanders. And this is what we found. The bottom graph shows morphine consumption. The gray is conventional pain management, the red is paravertebral catheter, and the gold is paravertebral catheter plus gabapentin. You can see that in all subgroups, there was decreased morphine consumption in the regional anesthesia group, and even more when you added gabapentin. And this, of course, led to a decreased length of stay. The same results, improvement with paravertebral catheter and improvement with paravertebral catheter with gabapentin. So this led to us standardizing our mastectomy protocol. These patients get ultrasound-guided placement of T3-level catheters. We inject 10 mLs of local anesthetic through the needle, ultrasound guided. We then thread the catheter 1 to 3 centimeters, and then again, under ultrasound guidance, inject 5 mLs more of local anesthetic through the catheter. The reason why we confirm that with ultrasound is we want to make sure our catheter is actually in the paravertebral space. So we want to see swirling of local anesthetic in the paravertebral space through the catheter. At the end of the procedure, we bolus each catheter with 10 mLs of local anesthetic per side. Before the patient leaves the recovery room, they are hooked up to an infusion device, and 7 mLs of local anesthetic per hour per side are started. The catheters are left in for two days and discharged or discontinued on post-up day two. If the patient's also having an axillary lymph node dissection, we historically did a single shot block at C7 to T1 spinous process level to achieve analgesia in the axilla. However, we currently do PEC blocks instead of the single shot block in the operating room after general anesthesia has been induced using ultrasound guidance and have had a huge success with this. For lumpectomies, we do a single shot paravertebral block using 10 mLs of local anesthetic at the appropriate level. This was a study in the Annals of Surgery from 1998 looking at the use of paravertebral blocks in the use of surgical management of breast cancer. And what they found was using the block, they could successfully complete the surgery with the block alone in 85% of the cases without converting to general anesthesia. This led to a marked reduction in pain, narcotic use, and post-operative nausea and vomiting. 96% of the patients in the paravertebral group were discharged the day of surgery, compared to 76% in the GA group. They had a 2.6 complication rate, which included epidural spread, pneumothorax, and failed block. They concluded the paravertebral block markedly improved the quality of recovery after breast cancer surgery and provided the patient with the option of ambulatory discharge, which clearly saves lots of money. This is a fascinating study published in 2006 looking at anesthetic technique for primary breast cancer and can it affect recurrence or metastasis? 
and they did a retrospective review of 129 consecutive patients undergoing mastectomy and axillary dissection for breast cancer. They followed the patients for approximately 32 months, and recurrence and metastasis-free survival was 94% versus 82% at 24 months, and 94 versus 77% at 36 months in the paravertebral group compared to the GA group, which is a huge study. And this led to multiple studies saying, well, how could this be? What does this mean? And here are studies in 2010, 2009, and 2010. And this is what they found. Changes in some perioperative cytokines may facilitate conditions conducive to immunological resistance of tumor progression and metastasis in patients receiving propofol plus paravertebral block compared to general anesthesia. They saw in this in vitro model of breast carcinoma cells, serum from patients receiving the block had reduced cancer cell proliferation, but not migration compared to the GA group. And finally, there was a possible protective effect against cancer recurrence and metastasis in the regional anesthesia group compared to the GA group, looking at multiple levels of hormones and immunologic factors. So the take-home message is that surgery and anesthesia is well documented to impair immune competence. We know the surgical stress response causes a marked attenuation of natural killer cell function. Well documented that morphine inhibits cellular and humoral immune function and depresses that. So what is the conclusion? If you can blunt the surgical stress response using regional anesthesia prior to incision, you can prevent immune impairment. And regional anesthesia spares postoperative or perioperative opioids in general. So this may make the difference between Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Jones, who had the exact same tumor load. If you can offer Mrs. Smith regional anesthesia versus Mrs. Jones, who doesn't get it, Mrs. Smith may have the better outcome because that one single cell that may or may not get out, depending on immune incompetence, may make the difference between long-term survival. This is a patient I took care of in the operating room who was actually a 46-year-old operating room nurse who presented with unilateral breast cancer. She opted to have a bilateral mastectomy prophylactically. I initiated the mastectomy protocol and placed bilateral paravertebral catheters in day surgery using Versed only for sedation. At Stanford Hospital, we have gone towards narcotic eliminating or narcotic sparing surgery for all the reasons we just discussed. No narcotics were used in the perioperative period. She was given IV Tylenol in the operating room and that was used for Q6 hours, for 24 hours. She was run on a propofol infusion with an LMA, no inhalation agents. She was discharged home on post-op day one with her bilateral catheters and disposable infusion pumps and a family member discontinued her catheters at home on post-op day three. The image on the right is after I placed the catheters and it was dressed with mastosol, steri strips, and tegaderms. We also placed thoracic paravertebral blocks for thoracotomies. This is a photograph my surgeon sent me after he opened the patient and saw the paravertebral catheter, labeled PVC, underneath the pleura. And the bottom of the image is the lung, which is collapsed. This is a study published in 2012 looking at thoracic epidural versus paravertebral catheters for analgesia after lung resection and looking at outcomes. It was a retrospective study looking at 1,500 patients who had undergone thoracotomy. In general, the patients who received the paravertebral block were younger, had a higher FEV1, a higher BMI, and a higher incidence of cardiac comorbidities. And this is what they found. There was no difference in postoperative respiratory complications compared to epidural, no difference in ICU stay or readmission, and no difference in in-hospital mortality. However, there was a decrease in the length of stay. And this was probably due to main maintenance of hemodynamic stability, preserving bladder sensation, and most importantly, promoting early mobilization due to a lack of any kind of sensory deficit or hemodynamic stability instability. Again, just to recap, the benefits included 
maintaining hemodynamic stability compared to epidural, preserving bladder sensation, and promoting early mobilization. Other benefits include clearly decreased pain, which leads to decreased narcotic use and decreased nausea and vomiting. If you query patients, they're more concerned about perioperative nausea and vomiting than they are about pain. So if you can eliminate this side effect from narcotics, you're doing your patients a real service. Clearly, this leads to a decreased length of stay, improving patient satisfaction, and also allowing conversion of the procedure to an ambulatory procedure. All of these benefits save the institution and the society and whole money. And this all leads to the surgical home model of care, which is another lecture altogether, but something I encourage you all to look into um, because this is clearly going to be on the forefront of medicine in the next decade. This is a patient who had a lobectomy, who is 73 years old with a stage one lung cancer. She was booked for VATS with a right upper lobectomy, but subsequently they had to open. A paravertebral catheter was placed in day surgery with IV versed only preoperatively. A postoperative infusion was started in PACU with PR and narcotics for breakthrough pain, although she received minimal narcotics during the perioperative period and was mostly controlled with PO analgesics, non-narcotic. The paravertebral catheter was DC'd on post-op day three after her chest tubes were removed, and I can tell you the patient had a remarkable postoperative course, and she was also my mother. And there's her paravertebral catheter. When do you do a single shot versus a catheter? Well, these are the things you need to consider. There is the same risk of a pneumothorax. It's less than 1%. So if a patient would benefit from prolonged analgesia longer than the duration of a single shot local anesthetic, then there's no downside in placing a catheter. The question is how significant will the pain be on post-op day one? Is a catheter indicated? Because a catheter does take longer. There's an increased cost with a catheter. The catheter kit is clearly more expensive than a single shot needle, as well as the infusion de device you would need to hook up to the catheter. And is the patient a candidate for a catheter? In other words, is the patient going home and when are they going home? We send a large majority of our patients home with all types of regional anesthesia catheters, but we have to really choose the correct patient. A patient that is, um, can understand the catheter, with appropriate care at home for a family member that you can communicate with when you call them on the post-op day one and post-op day two prior to the discharge of the catheter. The contraindications to a thoracic paravertebral block include infection at the needle insertion site and empyema. You can imagine what would happen if you pierced the pleura and dragged infected fluid through the paravertebral space and the muscles through the skin of a patient. It would be disastrous. Kyphoscoliosis and a previous thoracotomy can obscure the paravertebral space, but you will be able to see that with ultrasound. And coagulopathy is somewhat controversial, but I have many colleagues across the country that are comfortable with a elevated PT that they would not, an elevated INR that they would not necessarily put an epidural in, but they're comfortable putting a paravertebral catheter in. It's really a very individual decision. Complications include infection, hematoma, epidural spread, and pneumothorax. Intrapleural placement is possible if you have catheters. We had a patient come to the operating room for breast surgery who was 63 years old and otherwise healthy for bilateral mastectomies with paravertebral catheters for unilateral breast cancer. The block placement and the procedure were completely uneventful. However, in the post-operative um, PACU, she complained of shortness of breath, so a chest X-ray was obtained, which is located on the right-hand side of this slide. It was read as normal by the radiologist on call. However, she worsened overnight with increasing shortness of breath, and she developed a fever to 104.3 with chills, rigors, and hypotension. Her regular fever workup was negative, so a chest CT was obtained to rule out a pulmonary embolism. This is her CAT scan. They saw on the right side a pleural effusion, and there was her paravertebral catheter, intrapleural. And as luck would have it, the same on the right, a pleural effusion, probably an accumulation of local anesthetic and a paravertebral catheter. Now, interestingly, this patient had zero pain, probably because she had local anesthetic intrapleurally bilaterally. 
And the reason why I show you these slides is because complications do occur and they're acceptable and they're expected. The take home message is to recognize what the complications are, to see them, to look for them, and to communicate those potential complications with the surgeon and the patient. This patient had no issues with this complication. Her paravertebral catheters were removed, the patient defervesced, her blood pressure improved, and she was discharged home on post-op day six. This concludes our webinar today. I'd be happy to entertain any questions at this time, and I want to thank you for spending an hour with me to talk about paravertebral blocks.